AI has been woven into broadcast technology for years, but the development of generative AI has taken it to an entirely new level. I'm talking here about the chat GPT variety, AI that can synthesize massive bodies of knowledge, textual, audio, and video material, and produce whole cloth new content, a news story, for instance, a promo, or a whole package, among many other things. The implications of generative AI for broadcasting and numerous other industries are profoundly massive. This has news organizations scrambling to keep up with a technology that improves by orders of magnitude continuously. There are business, ethical, and even existential considerations to undertake as generative AI presents a step change on par with the emergence of the internet. I'm Michael Depp, editor of TV News Check, and this is Talking TV. Today, a conversation with Laura Ellis, head of technology forecasting for the BBC. We'll talk about what that interesting position entails along with developments in generative AI and what they mean for the business of media and the practice of journalism. We'll also look at what news organizations can and should be doing to meet the moment that AI has brought upon us. We'll be right back with that conversation. Talking TV is brought to you by Futuri's post-podcasting system. Last year, U.S. podcasting revenues grew 22% to $1.8 billion. When you compare podcasting with other forms of media, it continues to be one of the fastest growing digital channels. With Post by Futuri, you can add a podcasting element to your local newscasts and tap into that growth opportunity. Learn more about Post at futurimedia.com slash post for TV. Welcome, Laura Ellis. Nice to see you. Laura, let's start by clarifying what your position is at the BBC, head of technology forecasting. What does that mean and what does it entail? It's a great title, right? So if we could forecast, we'd be very happy, wouldn't we? So um, it's a it's a job which has many facets. Um, some of it is about getting out into business and seeing what the technology um, that is coming is going to mean for the BBC and how we respond to that and how as an organisation we get everybody involved and get them having conversations with us. So I run a, a brilliant team called The Blue Room, um, which is a tech engagement space. And we bring people in and we say to them, you know, this is happening, this, this new technological development, whatever it is, that might be generative AI, it might be digital identity, it might be, um, it might be something like picture quality. It, it's a really big range of things. And we say to them, how is it going to affect where you work? What can we use it to do that you can't do already? And um, how can we sort of hear from you about your concerns and your thoughts. So it's a very big conversation that we try to have with the organization, just linking up the kind of capabilities that are coming or that are already here um, with the, the potential use to, to serve our audiences. And so, so that's a big part of the role. And then as another part of the role, I do some work on um, just things like disinformation, so when I started the role, we had we uh, begun a media provenance project, looking at how we could put signals into media to track it back to the source, which with the advent of generative AI has become even more important. So um, it's, it's wide ranging. I speak to a lot of people every single day across the organization and outside. Um, it's never, never dull. You're reading new things every minute. Uh, it's exhausting and I love it. <laughs> Yeah, I want, to, I want to just ask you a little bit more specifically about the process by which you go about keeping yourself informed. How do you do that? I mean, what, what are you scanning continuously in order to, to stay abreast? So everything, I've got a, a stash of newsletters which kind of overwhelm my inbox on a kind of daily basis. And, I, and I've become very adept at scanning very quickly to see where the meat is and where the new stuff is. Um, it's quite it's quite reassuring and comforting. You must find the same when you see the same thing two or three times. You think, yep, yep, I've got that now, right? You know, I know that's something that isn't um, that isn't that isn't new. Uh, I, I now know that that's being discussed this week or whatever. Some things roll for kind of a long time. Some things are just like a flash in the pan, and it's catching those flash in the pan moments. That's I think some of the some of the part of this seeing those things that you think, hang on a minute, is that a new trend? Is that something that's starting? Is that something we haven't heard about? And one of the things I do to kind of keep across this is write a newsletter, which sounds like a really odd way to address things because that's even more time being used up but I find the discipline with a very good colleague of mine of writing it at the moment it's a generative AI newsletter every Monday we publish to about 200 people um 
within the organization it's a great discipline because it makes you keep across it and it makes you absolutely scan those newsletters and those kind of chunks of content that you're that you're bringing in i also go to lots of events um so i'm lucky enough to to be invited to things um i, I turn up to others that i'm not invited to and uh, just listen to what people are having to say about it have conversations with colleagues last week we set up a little salon as we called it in london with some uh, interested broadcasters just to kind of you know get our heads around what we were all thinking and share where that was appropriate so there's lots of different ways and um, it does feel incredibly full on. It's like proper fire hose Gen AI at the moment. That seems so. Well, let's talk about generative AI and how deeply as of this recording, it can wend into the news gathering and compositional process of journalism. Catch us up to where you, where it presently and competently can play a role in that. So before we go on to where it can play a role, I think I just want to kind of talk a little bit about why we're still doing this carefully. And I think the reason that you know we need to say that is you'll be only too aware of this, but there are so many issues around um, copyright, around legalities, around um, our own data, making sure that that's safe and around accuracy. And I think all of those things have potential to impact trust and trust in news is absolutely our kind of number one thing and if we lose that we lose everything so we're approaching this I think as quickly as we can but also with incredible caution when it comes to making sure that we don't breach trust by messing up on any of those fronts so that's the kind of primary thing where we find gen ai is really useful is in things like summarizing um, so in the first instance we've not had any of this audience facing yet but what we have started to do is look at how we can take corpuses of material and have Gen AI kind of reconstitute them and give us different experiences of them. Now, longer term, and we're not doing this yet, but, you know, organisations that I've spoken to believe that you could perhaps um, give experiences of content for different audience groupings as a result of that incredibly quickly. Something that would take a team of journalists an awful lot of time to write a whole new set of content, you know, for audiences, say, under 35 or audiences with English as a second language. We're still investigating those things. And I think one of the things we're very keen to do is to make sure that whatever we do with this technology, and the same applies to any new technology, is that we don't get carried away with the capabilities before we've really understood how we can use this strategically. So everything, every bit of effort we put into this has to deliver. And in the BBC, that's to a public service set of values um, and a set of you know, audience priorities. So getting that groundwork in is where we're at at the moment. And that's really important to us. You posit that generative AI can help journalists level up. How so? So I have a lot of journalist colleagues who um, talk about this a lot, and it's something we we, are, we consider you know in quite a lot of detail. So there are two elements to it. One of them is that some people, even journalists, um, some of our broadcast journalists, for example, have said this to me, don't actually like writing, <laughs> don't really enjoy writing and, and getting stuff down. Um, our online journalists kind of, it's their bread and butter, but broadcast journalists will sometimes say, it's not what I do, I speak. Um, and what a generative AI can do is to help you if you've got some ideas, a rough assemblage of ideas, it can help you write them in different ways. If you want to write an email and send it to somebody, if you want to write a story. And I think that is a really clever technology. One of the things that I think in society generally we could do is potentially use generative AI as a kind of exoskeleton for people to help level up right across society. So imagine if you were struggling because of your literacy or because maybe of your language to write a letter to the local council or your child's school. Um, generative AI can help you do that. And with a little bit of input can give you the perfect way of communicating, which I think is an incredible piece of leveling up technology. But going back to might there be a problematic side to that as well? I mean, if, you know, if you have somebody who isn't very good at cutting people open and messing around inside, do you want them to be your surgeon? No, I think this is more about um, personal use cases. So let's say, for example, that um, I have a debt issue and I want to kind of write to my bank or to my credit card provider. And I just don't know how to do that. I don't know how to find the words to do that. I can sure I can go online and I can look at the Citizen Advice Bureau or whatever it is, and I can find a, a way of doing it. But if I can use generative AI to take my knowledge and match it up with some skills around language, that gives me a leg up. It gives me something that I can then use to take to that credit card agency, to that bank and say, you know, this is what I want to say to you. So it, the whole kind of literacy aspect of it, I know of a case of a, a guy who runs a small business and he's using it to write his custom emails. And he says, you know, I got to kind of like, you know, um, I'm not sure what we would call it in, in, in the way where you are, but you know, I got to the 
GCSE level at school, so 16, I left school. I, I left school without any qualifications and I struggle to write. And I, when I write stuff, I'm aware that people think, oh, that's not grammatical, that's not correct. And he's using this to communicate with his customers. And that's one of the things that I've been thinking about when we were looking at how we might use it in newsrooms. How can we use this incredible capacity to give people skills that they don't currently have um, to, for benefit? Of, of a lot of people for uh, of the benefit of journalists and also for individuals. Just to that point quickly, do you think that right from, from the jump that it's important to let the audience know that AI has been used, that, that there might be some sort of notation in the story or you know, maybe at the end of it that, that indicates that? So because, because otherwise we think if it's got a byline on the piece that that person has composed that piece. I really do. I think it's absolutely essential. Um, ever since the first days of us writing uh, automated journalism, so um, just you know, marrying up a database with a story which had gaps in it. Um, so very, very simple early days where we were able to write a story once and publish it a thousand times. You know, for different areas of the UK, um, we thought it was essential to put on the bottom of the story that this story was written um, partly by a machine. Basically, um, we didn't want to mislead the audiences and and let them think any other way. And I do think that's a principle which, in maybe a decade's time, we might find quaint and old fashioned, but for now, I think is really important. There's a fantastic piece of work that's been done by the Partnership on AI, which is a, an organization designed to sort of uh, make sure we reap the good bits of AI and not the bad bits. And um, they have a, as a framework for the use of synthetic media, which we have worked on with them. And I think this, this deep thinking going into how you communicate with audiences without being intrusive and kind of awkward, but how you communicate with them that this is not the work of solely a human is really, really important to what we do. Especially if there's so much versioning work going on, as, as you were just citing through some examples of all the ways in which one piece of material might be versioned for various different types of audiences, it seems there needs to be some acknowledgement of that for the for transparency's sake. Um, I wonder how might generative AI effectively redefine, redefine what a journalist does and what consumers expect of a journalist? strong views about this as well which is that you know at its very simplest uh journalism is a human response to a situation and it's interpreting something that's happening i'm going to just use the kind of the broadest sense of this and i'm going to just put you into turkey when the earthquake was taking place um having a journalist who'd had a really terrible journey to get to a place and was then reporting from the front line of this terrible tragedy is something which you cannot replicate, I don't believe, um, using AI. So, you know, let's say in, in years to come, we, we just had pictures um, shot by somebody else and we tried to put a generative AI voice over that. For me, that doesn't cut it. And for me, that is a, 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 a specific piece of trust that we need to have in our media, which is that you have a real person, whatever their prejudice is, you know, and we all have them, whatever their, situation you know um arriving somewhere and giving you that story through their eyes and ears and senses is for me something we should be very very careful we don't lose in this process because it is precious and it is the soul of you know of journalism and what we do so i think having said that you know there's lots of ways that this is an assistive technology it isn't a replacement technology i don't think it ever will be but there are all kinds of people constructing all kinds of scenarios, which mean that we might just need to guard against that. Well, you've teed up the very next thing I want to ask you, which is, you know, at least a couple of different companies have developed or are developing wholly AI based media organizations. What, what is your take on the viability and the ethics of what they're able to produce? I think if you're explaining again to your audiences that this is what you're doing and that, you know, this is something which is generated by AI, um, there's nothing wrong with that. I think some organizations, you know, will see it as a fit for their business and others won't. I think if you were in the business of providing um, real, real journalism, you know, from telling stories from places where things are happening that the world wants to know about, um, that's never going to be a business model, but it might be a business model if you're a celebrity gossip site and you know that you've got a corpus of material, you don't have to be on a red carpet potentially, you know, you're pulling stuff together and you might be writing that via AI. That's a choice. 
Um, I, I worry about two things. I worry about a proliferation of, of automatically generated material, um, sort of swamping the whole zone where our news lives. And I also worry a little bit about just a sense of, of, of kind of losing track of the soul of human creativity. So we've talked about, you know, the observant nature of journalism, but also there's a creativity in, in, in involved in it. And however wonderful an AI output is, is it the same as, and is it as valuable as having a human in the loop? So I always think about my favorite soap opera in the UK, which is called EastEnders. And I think to myself, would I love it as much if I knew it had been written by an AI? And I, and I tell myself that I wouldn't. Now, you might say, how would you know? How would you know you might not know? And I might not know. And I would feel quite cheated if I didn't know and then found out. But I, I like to see and feel the sense of a human hand and a human brain in the things that I'm consuming. Now, maybe that will feel like an impossibly old fashioned view in, in you know, a decade, 20 years time. But I do think it's something we need to bear in mind. And I think the kind of the, the preciousness of human creativity is something we should really work to discuss and to preserve. Of course, in a decade's time, that preciousness of human creativity may be something that AI can effectively replicate by that point. It, it may. I mean, it, it is it is very clever. And I was um, musing only this week on the um, the retirement of OpenAI's tool, which was de designed to detect um, where generative content had been used. You know, there are all sorts of issues around how on earth you do know if if the person who's produced something is not minded to tell you. Um, and there are many ways they can tell you. There are there are ways of putting metadata in. There are there are all sorts of things you can do. Visual visual signals. A lot of this is still being thought about. But if the person who's created it is not minded to tell you, then then yes, you know, that there is a chance that you might see something and you might consume something and it would have been created entirely by an AI. You might enjoy it. You might go to bed that night thinking, well, that was really good. That was fantastic. What's wrong with that? Um, in my view, what, the only thing that's wrong with it is I do think you should be told because this is, this is you know, we have lived with consuming the sum of human creativity for quite a long time. And this is a big jump for us. And I think we need to ease people into it and see how we do feel about it, because there will be issues and there will be things that we need to deal with. The BBC is among a number of news organizations developing guidance for newsroom implementation of AI. Can you share some of the outlines of that guidance? And I realize it's very nascent right now. Yeah, I think in common with most organisations, um, some of it feels quite superficial at the moment. So um, it will develop and it will iterate and it will iterate along with these very fast moving tools that we're seeing, um, you know, new new capabilities from every every week. Um, for us, there is a bond of trust with the audience, which means that explainability is a really big part of what we are asking people to do. Um, secondly, there is a, an absolute um, ban, if you like, on putting BBC data into these tools because we still don't know um, if you've got, an, uh, particularly if you're not as part of an enterprise agreement, uh, we don't know where that data is going and we don't want there to be a risk that our own or third party data will wash up somewhere where it shouldn't. So there's a real sense that we need to be very careful what the inputs are to these tools. Um, and I think thirdly, there is this accuracy um, it's, uh, issue, which is which is really pernicious because the tools are designed to please and they're designed to make you believe that, you know, they're having a great conversation with you and they're telling you stuff that, that works in the, in the case of, for example, you know, let's just use chat GPT as an example. And the problem with that is I always say to people, when you first start using these tools, ask them about something, you know, because then you'll see, you know, where the issues are. Ask them about something you know really well and ask them detailed questions. And then you will find that, you know, actually there's um, a reliance on stuff that's wrong. Uh, and do that before you ask them about things you don't know. And I think there is a real issue with, um, I know a lot of organisations are trying to address it. A lot of these um, Gen AI organisations are saying, you know, we can make it, you know, work and we can give you citations and we can, you know, make these things more truthful. But the fact is that that's something we're going to need to keep a very close eye on because um, you will have seen the, the, the court cases that, you know, there was a lawyer that used ChatGPT to try to create a legal argument and it was completely wrong and the judge was pretty angry and there are consequences. And I think that's one of the things that we're putting out in our, in our guidance, you know, that we need to think about the consequences. Nothing is risk-free. Um, no technology is risk-free, but we need to be very cognizant of the risks that we're 
that we're using. And finally, um, training, just making sure that we provide adequate training for people who are using these tools or who will be using these tools to give them the best chance of understanding um, what they're doing and uh, using it to the, to, the, to the best extent and the most appropriate way. Organizationally, what do you recommend is a good process for continuing to iterate that guidance as the technology obviously continues to, to rapidly improve? How should, how should organizations set themselves up for that? That's a good question. And I can draw on some of the first things we did in this space, which was something called the machine learning engine principles we developed back in, gosh, must have been 2019 now. And these were designed um, in the early days of looking at recommenders to help our teams to to first of all examine what their use case was and then how this particular bit of machine learning they were using was going to help with that and then look at the consequences the potential unintended consequences and then once they'd used it to look at what actually happened and then go back and reflect on it so very much a kind of cyclical tool um examining uh why somebody had done something what it what it had achieved what the outcomes were maybe some of them unintended and then do we need to revisit the whole process again and how do we take this on so i think um having that kind of process where you've got learnings being specifically captured um where you've got you know red flags where they exist because obviously they will at some point um being raised and having a, a, a proper uh, process for acting on those and making sure that you know the problems that they have um surfaced or addressed is going to be really crucial so I think and most organizations that I speak to, um, ours included, are, are thinking about having some kind of body in place or potentially a function uh, attributed to an existing body. We have an editorial policy unit who are absolutely brilliant and have worked, you know, incredibly tirelessly for years on answering questions and dealing with this sort of thing. And it might be an offshoot of them, it might be a separate team. I don't think we know yet, but somebody will need to be making sure that we learn as we go along because you know this stuff moves quickly and i think there'll be things that it throws up that we are not even thinking about yet yeah that's why i'm just wondering who should be sitting at that table uh evaluating everything um you know, or should there be separate yeah for instance anecdotally i've been talking to some broadcasters who who in some cases seem to have a point person like one person who is kind of assimilating everything and and uh reading up and kind of testing some things out they don't necessarily have fully fleshed out committees yet per se but but it seems like that would be the direction in which things should be moving a panel of people and and ideally at this point as you see things what should who should that panel be comprised of at different levels or different aspects of a broadcast organization i think this is i think this is a really good bit of news for organizations because what it does is it throws into a room exactly the right people that should be talking about a lot of stuff like this so your lawyers your data protection experts um you know your ethicists your machine learning experts your editorial people and your product people and i think the more you get those people into a room together, the better your organization is. And on all sorts of fronts, not just on, on, on Gen AI, um, because it, there is a kind of still an old fashioned view amongst some people that technology is just the mechanism by which you deliver stuff, right? So you have a nice big chunk of news and there's a chunk of technology and it's gonna go down that pipe and it's gonna reach the, um, the user. And to be fair, that's how it used to work. But now technology is the medium and the message. And, you know, depending on your choice of, of social platform or your choice of um, the way you're going to deliver something, um, technology has much more of an impact about how you're speaking to your audiences and the decisions and the choices you're make, making. So I think having those teams working collectively together, um, bringing all their expertises to the table, it sounds unwieldy, but I think um, it, it's something that we really do need to kind of get used to doing because I don't think that there is a single person. There was a, a wonderful article last week about head of AI is a great new job title, but what is it? You know, and in every organization that has a head of AI, it's a different job. Um, and I don't think I don't think it's useful. It's like it's like calling somebody head of, you know, head of machines, you know. Um, we need to have um better ways of being really clear about what everybody's role is in making sure that as we roll this out, uh, it does what we want it to do. And what about the C-suite? How often should they be briefed? How, how closely should they, uh, the people there be brought in to this discussion at this point? So I, I, we will have a sponsor from you know the C level, and um, who will who will be our kind of you know Gen AI sponsor on this. Um, I think that's really good news. However, I also um, I have great affection for a strategist called Lucy Kung, who always talks about how um, C suite need 
more tech people, either experts within their number or people being brought in to kind of like bolster that conversation. And I think it's incredibly difficult for anyone working at that level to understand this fast moving stuff very quickly, unless they're a specialist themselves. So I think what it relies on is um, really, really good briefings and, and a real openness to receiving those briefings, fortunately, both of which we have in the BBC. And our, our team is called the, the Chief Technology Advisor Team. And we do weekly videos with, you know, these are the latest things you need to know. We do briefings, we do updates, we'll do stuff ad hoc. And it, a lot of it is pushed, but it can also be sort of pulled from the exec who will say, we want to find out more about this particular thing. We, 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 we need to know about this company, whatever it is. So I think having that kind of relationship between your tech teams and your C-suite is going to be a real distinguisher for organizations who are in this space. Okay, and we could go on for hours here, and I hope to pick up this conversation again with you very soon. But let me ask you one final question for now. Where are your current areas of greatest concern in terms of generative AI being weaponized for the creation and dissemination of disinformation? So my areas of concern are numerous because Gen AI literally does things in seconds that would take um, a bad actor who wanted to create something horrible, um, you know, hours previously. Um, I think one of the things that we really need to look out for is how we make sure that trustworthy content, however you define that, and it's very much up to the audience who they choose to trust. So I don't want to make any value judgments on any organizations. The technology we've been looking at under our media providence work is agnostic. Anybody could use it. But what it does do is it means that it will flag up where somebody has tried to spoof you. So if somebody's tried to spoof a piece of BBC content, the signals that we have in that content normally will not show up or they will show up in a kind of corrupted way. And I think trying to get in this great, you know, expanding sea of content, the boats to rise that are going to give people routes through to trustworthy news from providers that they that they understand and, and know and want to trust is going to be one of the key issues. And that's going to be something we have to work on with the platforms. Um, we have to work on with our audiences because there's a media literacy, news literacy, tech literacy aspect to this, which is really important. And I think it's going to be probably the foundational conversation in the new space in the next five to 10 years. I think you're probably right. Laura Ellis, you have probably one of the most interesting jobs in uh, all of media today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. You can watch all of our past episodes of Talking TV, including quite a few that tackle AI at tvnewscheck.com and on our YouTube page. We also have an audio version of the podcast that's available most places you get your podcasts. We have a new episode most Fridays. Thanks for tuning into this one and see you next time. A new episode of Talking TV is available most Fridays on tvnewscheck.com. You can also listen and subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and Spotify.